Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's portion of Scripture, uh, which I'll be explaining in a moment. Uh, this week's portion of Scripture is called Ki Tavo, which means when you enter or when you come. And I uh, apologize in advance if you can hear all sorts of lawn mowers in the background, but I'm in my office and people are working around me. And as you can see, it's very cold here in Johannesburg. That's why I'm wearing this uh, zip up hoodie to K-Way jacket. Uh, because it is freezing. So let's let the warmth of God's scripture just uh, fill us with his love, fill us with his revelation, and uh, we've got some awesome things we're going to talk about this week. So this week's portion of scripture, which is from, as we continue in uh, Deuteronomy, from 26 to 29, um, I want to look at in right in the beginning in 26 and just see what our Jewish people will be reading in the synagogue um, this Saturday morning. For those of you who are new to this format, what we do is we read the portion of scripture for the week that our Jewish people will be reading in the synagogue, uh, usually read by their rabbi. And the reason that we do this is because then you know what's going on and then you can have those conversations with the people that you work with or the people that you might know and say, hey, I was reading the portion of scripture for this week, which I know you'll be reading in the synagogue. And these are my thoughts pertaining to that. So we're going to dive right in, and we're going to go into uh, chapter 26 of Deuteronomy, and I'm just going to read to you guys. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. And you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. So just a few things to look at here, guys. Number one, uh, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance and have taken possession of it, and live in it. So what's important for us to, to look at here is that there's two things that happen when it comes to the promised land. Number one is the promise itself. God promises this land to his people as a possession that he will give to them at his perfect time. Okay, so there's number one is the promise. Number two is then the corporate responsibility of the children of Israel to then go into that land, take possession of it, and receive it as the blessed promise from God. And I feel like maybe we struggle with this um, in our walk with the Lord, in that He promised us so many things, but we are very quick to stand defeated and say, Oh, I don't have this, or I don't have that, or I wish I could have this, I wish I could have that. But maybe we need to start getting better at walking into that promise and actually taking that land, so to say, that is promised to us or that thing or that word that God has given us for our family, take possession of it and actually own that promise. And I think that's a challenge to all of us. For example, many families uh, are promised that uh, they would have children or that one day they would have a home. And, and maybe God's been saying to you for a while that these are the things that he wants to give you, but uh, you, you don't want to actually step out in faith and take possession of that thing that God has promised you. So I think it's important for us to, to just acknowledge that God promised us a blessing we must also be good stewards of his promises by going in and taking possession of that. Israel physically, corporately, collectively had to go into the land and actually take possession thereof under the strict guidance of God, listening to him with an attentive ear, making sure that they were following his instructions word by word, but taking the land. It's an action that they needed to do. So I think that's very important for us to meditate on. What I love about this as well is that he says, as you come into this land, you are to take the first fruits from the ground, place them in a basket and bring them to the priest or the high priest at the time. Now, first fruits is another topic that we seldom discuss um, in the church, but it's a topic that we should be discussing a lot 
um, because it's a very important biblical principle. And in these days, what they would do is the harvest that would come, literally the first of those fruits, they would take them as an offering to God and they would take them via the, the high priest. So how would we uh, take that into a modern context? Well, I'd like to talk about that in, in various ways. You can talk about that financially. I mean, there can always be first fruits financially um, that we can give to God as a, um, as a thank you and as a, a really a token of us saying, Lord, I know that the harvest you've got in my life is much bigger than this. And so I give you first of my fruits. Yes, that can be the case. But I'd like to talk about first fruits in terms of how God has made us. Because each one of us has got a very unique set of skills. And God has made us with a very unique character. And within that set of skills and that character, God has really made all of us with gifts that are unbelievably cool. All right. So for example, you could have the gift of giving, you could have the gift of talking, you could have the gift of hospitality, you could have all sorts of gifts that God has given you the gift of encouragement, for example. And what I'm seeing here in the scripture is God also saying, while I've made you this way, while I've made and know every hair in your head, I've given you gifts and talents and all these incredible things that you can use to be me in this world, to bless this world, we should be giving those first fruits of those gifts and talents already back to God. And this is what I mean. Is that yes, you could be a great giver. Yes, you could be a great speaker. Yes, you could be a lover of people. You could be great at hospitality. But have you ever considered to take the best of who you are, the very, very best, the first fruits of everything about you and say, Lord, this belongs to you. And just like in those days, what they would do is they would walk up to the high priest, put it in a basket and say, this is for you. So we know that our high priest, Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, who is called our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, we should be taking the best of us, the first fruits of who we are, putting it in a basket and placing it before Jesus and saying, Jesus, Use whatever you need to use. Take the best of me and use it for your kingdom, for your glory, for your will to be done. And I think that's an attitude where we don't give God what's left. We rather give him what's right, which is the very best of us. And so I want to encourage everybody that's listening right now to even take pen to paper and, and write down, what is the very best that you have? What is the very thing that would represent a first fruits of who you are? And how might you package that, put that in a basket and place it before our Messiah, before Jesus and say, I give this to you. Use it to do what you need to do. And I think this is a good attitude that can carry us in our walk with the Lord. It's a great attitude that can carry us in our Christian walk throughout our lives always giving the first and best of what we have to God. And that could mean on so many levels. It could mean financially. It can mean our gifts and talents. It can mean our character. All these things, the first of those things should really belong to God. I love that scripture that says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he will add all other things unto us. We need to make him our first priority. First fruits and giving them away means the person who's receiving them is our first priority. And that's what I think God needs to become in our lives. Even when you have um, children, and I, I'm not in a position where I've had children yet, but when you have kids, I believe the minute they are born, you should be able to say, Lord, you have given me this gift of a child. How might I raise this person to become a mighty warrior in your kingdom? How might I raise this person for your work so that they can bless people on your behalf? Literally, all the good stuff, all the first stuff, all the fruit in our lives, we should be willing and want to give it to the Lord. So my question for you to meditate on this week is, what have you got that you can give to Jesus? What's the best of you? Let's not forget what God gave to us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. The first fruits 
the first fruits of his begotten children, of Jesus, his only begotten son. He gave him to us. And why? Because he was showing us that we are his priority. And so I believe the least we can do is show that back to God. And you might be sitting there saying, how am I going to do this? Well, I got good news for you. Everything we do, even saying, Lord, how do I get better at making you my number one priority? We go before him and in his infinite grace, he gives us the strength, the know-how, the wisdom, and the heart to be able to behave correctly towards him only through his grace. Remember, nothing you can do can make you righteous in God's eyes. It's what he did for us that makes us righteous and in turn enables us to behave in a way that is holy and in reverence to him. So let's continue with this week's portion of scripture uh, because it starts talking about tithing. And while I'm not going to get into tithing this week, the one thing that I want to uh, just talk about is how it speaks of not just tithing to a priestly storehouse, but it speaks of being generous to strangers, orphans, and widows. And this is something my wife and I keep very close to our hearts, and it's something that we really try our best and always ask God to help us do this, to make sure that are we looking after strangers, orphans, and widows, and, and are we good at doing that too? I know that James, the brother of Jesus, felt this was an incredibly important biblical principle to adhere to. In fact, he even made big statements like, if you can't help widows, orphans, and strangers, then there is no religion among you. And uh, it's an interesting statement because I feel like we don't spend enough time talking about this kind of giving. Now, who's a stranger? Who's an orphan? Who's a widow? These are people that have lost their inheritance, okay? People that have lost somebody in their life that would be providing for them or giving to them, and it has made their situation very difficult. Now, for those of us who are blessed enough that we don't have those kind of issues, we should be asking God, how might we be able to become a blessing for these people, for these widows, these orphans, and these strangers? And you know, if you look all over the world, um, the political climate gets very heated when you're looking at strangers coming into one another's countries. And uh, I know some of you will say, yes, we have to keep uh, a check on these things. But if you look biblically, God is actually saying, this is all my land. These are all my countries. And if you're prosperous and you're living in that city, what you should be doing is welcoming strangers, maybe even bringing them in and then exposing them to me so that they stop being strangers but end up becoming family, brothers and sisters, um, according to scripture, which teaches us that once we know Jesus, we all become the family of God, Jew and Gentile alike. So. It's interesting to consider widows and orphans and strangers. The book of Ruth um, looks at some widows and we know what happens there. God is in the business of restoring and redeeming. God is in the business of restoring the inheritance that was lost to those who had a misfortune. So we should always be mindful of that. Maybe this week we can all pray together and uh, in our alone time just say, hey, Lord, how might I be a blessing to a stranger, an orphan, or a widow? Show me where I can step in and actually do something really cool um, and let them know that you love them. So I really like that, that that was in this week's portion of scripture. The last couple of things that I really want to look at is that there are these blessings, and um, it's a difficult passage of scripture to read because there's blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. And you read these things and you go, oy vey, um, am I going to be cursed because of ABC? And am I going to be blessed because of X, Y, and Z? And I'm going to read a few of them to you here, um, just so we can get the context. But then I really want to share something encouraging with you. So it says here in uh, chapter 27 from verse 9, Then Moses and the Levitical priests said to all Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. 
That day, Moses charged his people saying, when you have crossed over the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice. Now, how interesting is that? Because I look at this uh, narrative and I look at what happens on Mount Gerizim, where Levi, Judah, Joseph, and Benjamin are blessed by God. Now, if you look at the geographical uh, region in Israel of Jerusalem, that is the border of Benjamin and also the border, uh, it's also in the land of Judah. So you can see that this is a city that was always designed to be blessed by God. And how much more blessed could it ever get than the Messiah himself being born not far from the city in Beit Lechem, the house of bread, but in this region of Benjamin and Judah, where the anointed one, the king of the world would be born and where he will return to one day. We can certainly see that these lands, that these tribes have really been blessed by God. Interesting to see some of the, uh, the tribes there that got a curse. One thing we know about the tribe of Dan is that it's left out of the book of Revelation. That's right. When you read the tribes in the book of Revelation, Dan is not present there. And there's a myriad of theories and theological uh, answers to, to that and why Dan is not in there. Uh, but the region of Dan, if you want to just know modern day, that would be kind of Tel Aviv. Um, and those areas around there. So it's interesting to see that there were blessings and there were curses. And uh, why were these people cursed? I'm going to read some of them to you. Cursed be anyone who dishonors his mother or father. Cursed be anybody who moves his neighbor's landmark. Cursed be anyone who misleads a blind man on the road. Now, these things are tackled in the New Testament by Jesus. But most of these things as well can be traced to the Ten Commandments. For example, kabed et avicha ve'etimecha, which is honor your mother and your father. That's in the Ten Commandments. And there are curses pronounced because the people weren't honoring mother and father. Um, and you can see in the New Testament as well, Jesus starts talking about how we're supposed to behave. And I want to just go down and look at the blessings for obedience um, and just see what God is going to say here. But before I do that, I want to just remind you all that all these curses, which were attached to behavior, okay, the people could never keep these laws, guys. They were never able, not even close. There was only one man who ever kept all the laws, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua, the anointed one, the Messiah. Man has never been able to keep it. So if it were up to us, we would legitimately, we, we, we would every day be in this perpetual curse because God would have to curse us from morning to evening because we break his commandments over and over and over again. So here, here's the gospel and here's the good news is that despite all of our law breaking and despite all of our bad behavior and despite all of the things we always do wrong, God sends his only begotten son to die for us on the cross. Why? because he takes the curse of mankind upon himself. All these curses that were in store for us, the wrath that was stored up for us, Jesus takes that wrath. Jesus takes these curses upon himself on the cross at Calvary. And so we can be really grateful today that we don't have to read this with fear and trepidation, that God is going to continuously curse us because we can look to the finished work of Jesus Christ, our Messiah on the cross, and know that he has done everything necessary for us not to be cursed, but what I want to read for you now, to be blessed. Because these are referred to in chapter 28 as the blessings for obedience. Now, we were never obedient in our own nature and in our own way. As humans, we were never obedient. We were always disobedient. But because our Messiah was the most obedient of them all because in his obedience, he took the 39 lashes in his obedience. He got dragged through the mud in his obedience. He got a crown of thorns stuck to his head in his obedience. He was nailed to a cross in his obedience. His blood dropped to the ground in his obedience. He gave up his ghost and he died 
for the sins of the world, to the Jews, for the Gentiles, for all humanity. And he did that so that we would be seen as obedient in the eyes of God, perpetually obedient. I'm not talking about when we miss it here and there. I'm talking about eternal. I'm talking about God looks at us and he sees us as righteous because of what his son did for us on the cross. And I'm going to finish by just reading a few of these blessings. And I want you to receive this because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. This is what you can receive from the Lord. And remember what I said about when you have the promise, you've got to take it. I want you guys to take this. I want you to take possession of it. And I want you to own it. And I want you to take the first fruits of all these blessings and give them straight back to God because they belong to him in the first place. And listen to this. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, speaking to Israel. So let me read this in a different way. And if you faithfully obey the fact that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, died for your sins on the cross, which I commanded him to do, then I will deem you righteous for all eternity. And listen to what he says about you. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way, but flee in seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself. If you keep the commandments of the Lord, say it in a different way. If you believe, follow, and Acknowledge Jesus Christ as Messiah of the world, as Messiah and your Lord, your God, your King. What's so cool about all these blessings, guys, is that God gives us these blessings so we can give first fruits back to Him, but so that we can become a blessing to other people. This isn't so we can grow fat and store up in our barns. This is so everything that God gives us, we can use to show the whole world that he is a God who dies for us. He is a God that takes our place and gets cursed instead of us. And he is a God that wants to perpetually bless us. And so I want you to receive this right now, that God wants to bless you. God wants to love you. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of God. Through Christ Jesus, nothing can tear you away from him, him being completely happy with you. You are his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. Receive that right now, that God is well pleased with you. Receive the fact that you don't need to worry about the curses because he took that upon himself. But instead, he wants to bless you. He wants to give you an eternal life with him. He wants to give you heaven. He wants to remove any idea of eternal separation. And he wants you joined to him, his bride, to our groom forever and ever. Let me just pray for you. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Yeer Adonai panavelecha v'yikunecha. Isa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and the Lord give you his peace through the Prince of Peace, the one who took all of the curses upon himself, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. God bless and be blessed everyone.